Well, it's one, a vision that the problems that we see in the world are due to the fact that other people are just not as bright or as compassionate as they are. Uh, and that there are all these solutions out there waiting to be discovered and that they have them. And that these solutions are to be imposed upon the rest of us uh, by, by the power of government through taxation or in other ways. Uh, and what's really crucial about it is that their passion is so, so much greater than the passion on the other side, largely because what they have involved is more. Who is the they? Oh, the, 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 um, the media elite, the uh, academic elite, political elites. And, I, and the reason we can talk about their vision, even though they obviously vary in their opinions, uh, is that the basic set of underlying assumptions about the world are very similar. Um, and because these assumptions are the prevailing assumptions, uh, the need to find evidence for them or to offer proof is much less. If something, ha if something happens, they'll explain it in a way which will fit that vision. For example, uh, when they find that um, prenatal care is less among blacks than among whites, and that um, infant mortality rates are higher, uh, they immediately assume this is because of society's neglect, and therefore if only the government will step in and provide more prenatal care, that, that problem solves itself. But in reality, uh, other groups have even less prenatal care than blacks and don't have any more infant mortality than whites. Uh, but they don't ever get to that second stage because once they've seen something that fits their conception of how the world works, that's sort of the end of it. Uh, let, let me go back to that idea of who the they is. So you got the New York Times, the Washington Post, Harvard, Stanford, all the usual suspects. I think that when people say things like, uh, more American wives are battered on Super Bowl Sunday, you see, than any other time of the year, uh, and, and there's not a speck of evidence for that, uh, that is calculated. Because they're, 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 oh, I mean, you, somebody, there, there, is, there is no data that can even be misinterpreted that way. In other words, because there is no data, period. And so, yes, but I think that 99% of the people who believe it are not calculating. Mm -hmm. and, I think, and I think one of the reasons that it flies without, without even being challenged for evidence mm -hmm. is that there is a certain vision of how the world is, and in that world, men are oppressing women. And therefore, when you say something like this, it fits the vision, and that's the end of it. There's no, there's no demand for evidence. There's a four-stage uh, 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 pattern. And in the first stage is what, what's what I call the crisis. And so we're hyped to believe that something is a terrible crisis for which something must be done. Uh, and uh, what, was, what was fascinating to me in doing the research for the book is that very often the thing that's said to be in crisis has often been getting better for years on end. But that gets ignored. Then the second stage for, is... For example, infant mortality, to, to use one of well, the Well, uh, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about... Um, um, Preg uh, teenage pregnancy and, and venereal disease. Uh, those things were getting better. Teenage pregnancy was going down for more than a decade before sex education was introduced. Venereal disease, uh, syphilis in 1960s, uh, was only ha had only half the incidence that it had in 1950. So all these things are going down, yet, yet we're said to need sex education to deal with this crisis, which is then manufactured. And again, this is where the calculated part comes in. Now, 99% of the people who hear this don't, un don't know that. And, but, but the reason they accept it is because they also share the same vision. And because this is consonant with that vision, they don't have to ask for evidence. All right, so what's, what's stage two? Uh, that stage two is the... The, the first one is there's a crisis. Yes. They establish a crisis, usually an artificial one. Yes. Okay. Uh, then, then, then stage two is the solution. You have a solution for this crisis. In this case, you have sex education in the schools. And then uh, at that point, you say, if, if we do this, this will lead to beneficial result A. The critics say, no, it will lead to detrimental result Z. Stage three, you put it in the results, you put it in and directly you find detrimental result Z, namely venereal disease and teenage pregnancy take off into the stratosphere. And then stage four is the fascinating part in which they simply say, no, that doesn't prove that this was a bad policy because there are many factors. There's complexity. It's simplistic to blame it on this. But they run through this routine on so many different things, including crime. Similarly, they said, you know, in 1960, uh, Judge Bazelon said we just desperately need to have some kind of change in the criminal justice system. Now, in 1960, uh, there were fewer murders than there had been in 1950, 1940, or 1930. Uh, but again, that was completely ignored. And so now we have the revolution in the criminal justice system. People say, no, if you have to put these new things in, there'll be more crime than before. They put them in. Uh, almost instantly, the declining crime rate turns around and heads up again. And they say, no, it's simplistic to blame this on, on this. There are the root causes and the neglect of society and all the rest of it.
So it's heads I win, tails you lose. You think the increase in uh, venereal disease was caused by, by sex education? I don't education. have to even say that. I don't even have to, have to believe that. All but, I have to say but is do they... You, but do you? Oh, I think, I, I think it's, it's hard to explain otherwise. I mean, you, know, you don't get social changes that drastic in a, in a few years without some particular cause. But I, I, that, that, the argument doesn't depend on that at all. The point is, they created the crisis artificially. The evidence shows there was no crisis. Uh, and when, and, but they would not sub even subject it to any empirical test. If they want to show some other fact that came in and really caused this, I'm happy to hear that. Now, w w why would a group of, of liberal intellectuals or politicians or media stars or whatever, why would they sit around and decide to uh, uh, dismember or dilute the criminal justice system if they thought in advance that it would raise the amount of criminality. Oh, they, 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 didn't, they didn't think that, but the point is... They just thought wrongly that it would, be, that it would help. Yes, but, but it would also give them an enormously larger role than they had before. I mean, a judge who just sits there and applies the laws that have been passed by the legislature has a very minor role. But if he takes the expansive uh, judicial activist role, then of course he's on the leading edge. Similarly with the war on poverty, you, you can show how dependency on government was going down, poverty was going down before this program was ever put in. And within a few years, dependence on government was going up, and after a few more, more years, the absolute number of people in poverty was going up. This was sold to the country, not on the grounds that if you transferred money from A to B, that B would have more money. That was not the argument. The argument was that dependency would be reduced. This will then, you give them job training and all those kinds of things, parenting skills, the whole bit. And this will then be an investment that will pay off in the future because there'll be fewer people dependent upon the government than there were before. And I go through a great number of people from John F. Kennedy to Lyndon Johnson, the New York Times, again, all the usual suspects. The first order of business is to evade the criteria that they themselves set up when they set this out. And so no matter what happens, if, the if, if, it's, if it's a failure by the original criterion, then we just find another criterion by which it will be a success. A lot of the things that, that came out of the Great Society, uh, I mean, building all those junior colleges and community colleges. Oh, I would disagree entirely. I think that was a tragedy of the first That magnitude. was a tragedy. Yes. Why is that a tragedy? You have millions of people who have absolutely no desire for an education using up billions of dollars of the taxpayers' money, and not only not getting an education themselves, making it more difficult to give an education to those people who came to college with an idea of getting one. Now you say they have no desire for an education. I mean, nobody is herding them into these community colleges and into the junior colleges oh, and into the state oh, universities. Oh. I mean, they have a desire, those, obviously. No, they do not, obviously, because lots of things go on in those places that are not education. I mean, where else can you find so many uh, uh, young people of the, of the uh, same age and opposite sex in one place? Uh, a, a nice, convenient place to be. But anyone who is taught in, these, in, in, in a lot of these places, this, this ferocious desire for education as such is not terribly visible. We've set up a society where you have to be credentialed with a certain amount oh, of college, but, so can't, aren't they able to get a better job no, because this, of this their this credentials? No, this is the fallacy of composition. Uh, you know, if, if one person stands up in the stadium, he sees the game better, but if they all stand up, they don't all see the game better. Uh, as long as, you know, if you, have, if you have a degree and the other guy doesn't, then you get ahead of him in the employment line. But we're not going to all get ahead of each other in the employment line by all getting degrees. We have to get more people into the education system because that's the way to compete. And we look at the data and we see that uh, the people with more education are earning more money than ever before relative to the people with less education. People who that's all a fallacy of people, everybody standing people, up in the stadium. People, people who fly on the Concord, kids who've flown on the Concord undoubtedly will make more money than people who, kids who've only gone on buses. That does not mean if we put a lot of people on the Concord, we're going to raise the national income. You can't blame the, the crime rate on the fact that there's more poverty, that there's less poverty, uh, there's more affluence. It's not due to foreigners because, as you say, we've won the Cold War. Uh, all the normal things that you might blame all this on aren't there. It's not because of diseases, because science has conquered more diseases. It's all because of self-inflicted wounds. And I'm saying these are the people who inflicted those wounds, and this is why we shouldn't listen to them anymore. What are the nature of those wounds. Crime. No, no, no. I, the disintegration of the family. The disintegration of the educational system. 
And those, and, and it, it's not going to matter. We, we'll be like the man who gained the whole world and lost his soul. I, is there a common root to all of those, uh, all of those problems? It's the notion that ordinary people cannot be trusted to make the decisions that they've been making, but these must be preempted either by judges in the case of crime, uh, by the schools taking over the indoctrination of other people's children behind their back and, in, and, and against their uh, protests. Uh, or what was, what, what was the other one, uh, the, the family, uh, putting, uh, taking money from the taxpayers and subsidizing behavior, as well as encouraging it and legitimizing behavior that has turned out to be enormously self-destructive, uh, undermining the family in a thousand different ways. You make this uh, vigorous attack in the vision of the anointed that we should no longer listen to these people. That's sort of the, ba they've been wrong, it's, they don't prove their points, uh, it's hurt us. Who should we listen to? We should listen first and foremost to our own experience. You seem to act as if there must be alternative saviors. We should stop looking for saviors. I mean, the society has not existed for thousands of years because it had a succession of saviors. It's existed because it has institutions and processes through which people can realize their own goals. No, I, I understand that, but, but, y y but you are attacking people who, uh, who would like to lead us and tell us how the world works. No, no, they, no, no, they don't want to tell us how the world works. They want to, they want to take over the decision for us. They don't tell the f parents how they ought to teach sex education to their children. They put this material in the schools behind the backs of the parents with instructions not to let the parents see it.